there is a brand new platform that allows you to invest in space industry companies before they go public. Historically, this privilege has been reserved for only the wealthiest of investors, but now everybody can get in on the emerging space economy thanks to the work of a startup called Spaced Ventures. Private companies with innovative technologies are raising capital on Spaced Ventures, and participating in these funding rounds actually allows you to own a piece of the pre-IPO company you invest in. This startup is completely changing the game, and I'm honestly surprised that I didn't hear about them sooner. But that's why I'm here. Today we're going to give you a complete rundown of what Spaced Ventures does, and we'll even get a chance to have a conversation with the CEO himself, Aaron Burnett. So let's go. So before we talk to Aaron Burnett, let me get you up to speed on everything Spaced Ventures is doing. Their goal is to democratize the space industry by creating the first ever space investment portal. And they are able to do this with the relatively new method of equity crowdfunding. And this differs from regular crowdfunding because you're actually able to own a piece of the company you invest in. This is changing the game, not just for investors, but for space companies as well. See, the current VC landscape is tailored towards software companies, which tend to have low upfront costs and very short return times. But space companies have higher upfront costs and longer turnaround times, making it much harder for innovators to fund their ideas. So equity crowdfunding has the potential to change all that, and as a side benefit, investors like you and me get to get in on the ground floor of these innovative companies. As of the making of this video, Spaced Ventures has closed four funding rounds, all of which raised significantly more capital than their initial goal. Now, it is worth noting that while investing in seed stage companies does offer the potential for significantly more reward than public companies, that is balanced out with an increased level of risk. But Spaced Ventures is working to prepare their investors for that risk by providing a detailed breakdown of all of their companies directly on their website, so that investors only have to go to one place to do all of their due diligence. On top of that, every single funding round has its own Q&A form, and most of the questions on there tend to be answered by the founders of the companies themselves. So essentially what they're trying to do is to create an all-in-one investment platform, information database, and space tech community. But with that, let's hear from the CEO himself. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So where did the inspiration come from to start Space Ventures? You know, Space Ventures inspiration, it, it, you wish it was like, you know, a light bulb moment, very obvious. Uh, for me, it was a little bit more like a slow flickering light that got so bright I couldn't ignore it anymore. So um, really where it started was um, I've been investing since I was 12. My mom opened a custodial brokerage account for me. It was a very interesting time to learn how to invest, but I've been mainly a... Um, more of like a hobby sort of investor. So I've been uh, uh, watching the industry, paying attention to it for a long time. Uh, but then I'm watching the Falcon Heavy, the first one with a Tesla on top, take off in 2018. And my mind kind of just blows open as far as like my, my passion for space and science and science fiction and things that I've grown up watching. It's like clearly happening in front of me because these two boosters landing side by side is about the most science fiction sort of Thing I could think of um, that's happening in real life. And I, so I, I just, that started me on this idea of I want to be a part of the industry. I want to, you know, help in any way I can increase space innovation. Um, so it took about two years <laughs> from that point, uh, a little bit over that to where I actually got to a point where it all kind of made sense after talking with a lot of space founders, realizing they had funding problems after considering the opportunities and, and the limitations that there aren't very many opportunities for retail space investors like myself at the time. Um, so I wanted to create more access. The companies needed the money. And I was like, wait a second, you know, maybe there's something here. Um, again, it was something, it was one of these concepts that should have been real easy, uh, should have been obvious. <laughs> I look back, I'm like, I should have figured this out years ago. Um, but uh, after about two years uh, and, and finding the right partners and, and the co-founder that it, with Brant Arsenault, um, getting him on board, just kind of made sense. And then we, we took off from there and started building it. Amazing. So why have private companies been closed off to the public historically? And how is equity crowdfunding changing that? To answer your question, we have to go back in history a little bit. You know, back in the 30s, you know, in the in the heyday of, of the stock market uh, and in the 20s and 30s, um, people were going around and selling 
stock, uh, you know, paper that said it was a company to like farmers, you know, in Illinois or whatever. They're just, you know, it was the coolest thing since sliced bread was to invest in a company. Um, and so it was very easy to invest in companies and you could just have a piece of paper that essentially said you could do that. And so there were a lot of snake oil salesmen selling worthless people, pieces of paper to all sorts of people that weren't, you know, sophisticated enough to understand the stock market. I mean, to be fair, all that stuff was relatively new anyway. So most people weren't really getting to it. So eventually what happened was, um, you know, the, the, the government created this this rule that essentially said that you cannot invest um, in a, a private company unless you are of a certain level of wealth. If you if you had that much money, and this was back in the third, I think it's the Securities Act of 1933. But that was essentially the rule, right? If you're not that level of you know wealthy, then you're probably not smart enough to invest in private companies, and that has governed. <laughs> from the 30s that has governed this whole concept that is private companies are locked to to individual investors yeah so right like understanding the public uh companies right they have to go through all these documentation and paperwork they have to have all these audits they have to report quarterly there's a reason that most companies stay private for so long and that's because that's that's an onerous thing to be to have to do you have to have a whole financial arm of your company that you really don't need to get started and get going, which is, you know, where most of your growth happens as a company. So that's why so many companies stay private. Uh, it's why venture capital, they can kind of pool money together and they can invest in these companies because, you know, they they operate as a, you know, one of these accredited investor or qualified investor entities. They kind of don't have to follow the same rules as the retail investor because of that. And so they're able to, you know, invest in these companies when they're growing from 1 million to 10 million to 100 million uh, and a billion, which is a lot of opportunity for growth, they're able to invest at those stages. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, right, CF, re equity crowdfunding, the, the rules were written into law back when crowdfunding was like kind of a new thing <laughs> and kind of a cool thing. So the world, the term crowdfunding has a little bit of misconception. You think Kickstarter, you think Indiegogo equity crowdfunding, similar concept. I mean, fundamentally, it's the same thing, pooling lots of small checks together to, to buy large portions of equity. Um, so the advent of that coming in uh, in 2012, I believe, when the rule was written into law, but then the SEC took about four years to actually put the code, codify that and hear the rules to follow. <laughs> so about 2000, end 2015, early 2016 is when regulation crowdfunding started to be a thing. And what that functionally does is it allows retail investors to invest. There's some rules that we have to follow so that we don't, you know, lose all of our money and things like that, but pretty easy, but it opens up in theory, all private companies. If they choose to use that exemption, that regulation crowdfunding exemption, they'll be able to raise from the public, which is a very cool and it, obviously something that's great for me. And as a space, you know, I go and try and find all the space companies to do that. How are you preparing investors to invest in this new landscape that's very different from investing in post IPO companies? Trying to find cool new space companies and trying to really weed out the charlatans and the snake oil salesmen, right? The, the, the upside of space is it's cool and very inspiring. The downside is the more cool and inspiring something is, the more people like to use it to mask, you know, things that they're trying to <laughs> nefarious kind of uh, things that they're trying to pull over on people. Um, so th there, it does exist. There's a lot of people and some people are well-intentioned. It doesn't mean that they're not, um, you know, there's, there's people that are trying to do really cool things. They just don't necessarily have the capability to turn that into a company and then make it investable. Right. So there's a lot of complications to go into it. Really. When we look at a company, we look at a few things. One is, you know, is the technology viable? And, and by the way, we're, we're not, sitting down with um you know everyone and saying like this is guaranteed to work or anything we're just saying is this something that could work does it break 10 laws of physics or something um or is it something that maybe only I, i've heard someone say this uh as long as it doesn't break two laws of physics you know it, it's it's a good idea <laughs> uh so it's okay if it breaks one but not two um so we have a lot of smart people that look at this we have um i don't know 20 25 uh investment advisors at this point that look at deals people from the aerospace industry people from finance background um 
hundreds of years of combined experience to say, this doesn't pass a sniff test, this does, um, here, what are, you know, they can solve this, but what does that mean for the market and that kind of thing. So, you know, we look at it first, do some initial kind of diving into it. We send it to our investment advisors. They look at it deeper and then um, we send it over to uh, our legal teams to look over IP and make sure that's a real possibility, like, you know, it can be protected, right? But again, right, we do all of that, but just like any venture capitalist, if they're lucky, they'll hit one big winner out of 10. And the idea is that that one winner makes up for all of the losers, <laughs> the, the nine losers or the 19 losers, right? We try and approach it from that mentality. We don't, we don't have any kind of, uh, you know, guarantee of success or anything like that. We can't, um, even the best VCs in the world can't do that. So, you know, we just put it out there. We, we try our best on due diligence and we try and give, you know, encourage founders to, to bring their opportunity to invest in their company to the public. You guys are not just trying to build an investment platform. You're also trying to build a community. So what can you tell us about the community you're trying to build at Spaced Ventures? You know, Spaced Ventures, right? I, I think it's I think we can technically say already we're the world's largest community space investors. But the point of community is, you know, making sure that we can kind of talk together and be smarter together. And ultimately, what I want to do is encourage not just investment for an, from an ROI perspective, but we're kind of, you know, investing in our own future, right? We're taking ownership of the future we want to see. So one way to make that happen is to invest in companies building it. Yeah, I, I came out of um, being so inspired by space. I came out of like watching a NASA video or whatever, right? There's cool Artemis videos that are out there. You kind of get inspired and excited. And then they end the little meatball logo or worm logo comes up and it ends and the music fades. And it's like, and now what? It's kind of a big, <laughs> you know, adrenaline rush and a drop off. So how can we be a part of that? So the way I thought of it is at a very high kind of ethereal level is uh, we're the call to action on the end of that <laughs> kind of inspiration, right? We can put some money to work. We can uh, force ourselves to learn a little bit more about the companies, the, the industry, the landscape. And then we go from there to, uh, you know, investing some more or, you know, and in, in creating the next hundred or thousand SpaceX's that will end up, you know, creating so much innovation that we won't even recognize, you know, civilization or the industry 10 years from now. Where can people go to learn more about Space Ventures? Uh, so spacedventures.com, it's space with a D. Uh, hopefully you won't forget that after the first time, but spacedventures.com. Uh, you know, we have listings and things like that with actual deals coming out and, you know, sign up. It, it, we have a lot of educational materials there. Aaron, thank you so much for taking this short period of time out of your day to talk to us. We're really excited about everything you're doing. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy with what your guys are doing here, what you're doing, Nathan, and educating the space investing community. We need more of it.